The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 17, beginning at the 20th verse. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that, our, so that the, word may, the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and, I, and have loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire those that are also whom that have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with, the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. For the gospel of the Lord, praise, praise to you, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. May the words that come from my mouth make sense because they are inspired by your name and your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, if you've just listened to uh, today's reading that Alex so beautifully read and thought to yourself, I'm not sure if I really took all of that in. Don't be too hard on yourself. It is a bit of a tongue twister, and both um, Sheila, who read at 7.30, and Alex, who read this morning, did an amazing job of what is a challenging passage to read. It's actually the third part of a very long prayer that goes for a whole chapter as Jesus prays just before his arrest and crucifixion. And this morning, we don't have the benefit of hearing part one and part two to put it all into its complete form. The group of people who originally ordered the Bible readings into a three-year cycle give us a different part of this prayer on each of the three, uh, each of the three years of the seventh Sunday of Easter, which is always the Sunday after ascension, when Jesus ascends to heaven. So we get part one in year A, and in this section, Jesus prays for himself. We get part two in year B, where Jesus prays particularly for the 11 disciples who are left after Judas leaves. And we are in year C in the three-year cycle, and so we get part three, where the focus of Jesus' prayer is on those who are yet to become believers. In one sense, in this particular section, Jesus is actually praying for us, for you and me. Jesus prays, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in in me through their, the disciples, word. So when you think about it, you and I, who are believers in 2022, are in a long line of connection, conversion, and relationship that has its origin in the work and the words of those original 11 disciples. We find out next week at Pentecost how many believed on that one single day on the first day of Pentecost. And many more still believed through their ministry in the years to come. Through those believers, others believed. Through the other believers who believed, others believed. And so on, and so on, and so on for almost 2,000 years until you get to us. What is Jesus praying for us then? Well, it seems pretty simple. It's not that we would change the world. 
It's not that we would go out and rescue the last, the least and the lost. It's not that we might win multitudes of converts to Christ. It's not that we would live holy and blameless lives. It's not that we would replicate the profound words, miracles and actions of Jesus. He just simply prays that they, we, may all be one. Simple, right? Easy. It's not that changing the world, social action, leading people to faith, living lives that are examples to others, and sharing, teaching, and acting in the world don't matter. They certainly do. You can't read the Gospels and walk away with the view that those things don't matter. But in this prayer, which is known as the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays for only one thing for us, that we might be one. I wonder if you realise how big a prayer that actually is and the potential impact and magnitude of oneness. This oneness is not gentle. It's not superficial. It's not in the sense of getting along or liking each other. It's not just that we can all go along and cheer for the same sporting team or vote the same way. In the English, we use the word unity, And historically, at this time between Ascension and Pentecost, there's been a time set aside for purposeful prayer for Christian unity. It's actually quite an odd time in the church's calendar. Jesus, like Elvis, has left the building and and ascended into heaven. And we're not at that first day of Pentecost yet. And the Holy Spirit hasn't descended on the disciples. So all we are left with is us. It's a bit of an academic construct, if you think of it. We are a long way away from that first Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit hasn't left us. And the Holy Spirit is still at work in and through us. And even in that very first period between Ascension and Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was still present. The Holy Spirit was present at the beginning of creation. What Pentecost is, is a massive movement of the Holy Spirit, not the first appearance of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to leave that to Mary Ann uh, to explore a little bit more in detail next week. But back to Jesus' prayer. Because when you think about that idea that all we have is just you and I as believers, in this season of the church, I think it helps us to understand the depth of what Jesus is praying for us. That's why I'm I'm not sure that unity is strong enough of a word to describe what Jesus is actually meaning when he prays that we might be one. Because in our culture, in our context, unities can so easily be devolved into something as superficial as just getting along with the people that we disagree with just for a moment. In verse 23, Jesus prays that we may be completely one. The Greek word that we translate as completely is the verb form of the word that we also translate as perfect. So Jesus is praying that we might be perfected in oneness. Isn't it reassuring that Jesus isn't praying that we would be all perfectly one all of a sudden, all at once, that we've actually got a bit of time and a bit of a journey to be perfected? It's a process being perfected in oneness. 
But being perfected in oneness is so much bigger than praying that we would all like, accept, and get along with each other. To emphasize the point, Jesus compares the oneness he's praying for us to the oneness that he experiences in relationship with the Father. And that is a big prayer to pray. Just as well Jesus is praying this and not us. But it makes me wonder, did Jesus actually realize how polarized our world would be in 2022 and how hard it would be to actually be one? We seem to be increasingly pushed into groups of people who are like us and then everyone else. And those people who think that they're right and those other people who also think that they're right but really we think that they're wrong. How do you become perfected in oneness in such a polarised world? Jesus is God and God is Jesus. And again, we'll get to a bit more of that on Trinity Sunday. But God the Father reveals different aspects of the character of God while God the Son reveals other aspects. There are similarities and commonalities, but to get the fullest understanding of the whole character of God, you need to look at what God the Father reveals, what God the Son reveals, and what God the Holy Spirit reveals. The oneness of God isn't an identical replication in each person of the Trinity. The Father is layered over the Son, who is layered over the Holy Spirit, like a kaleidoscope to reveal the full magnificence of the character of God. If Jesus is praying for this same oneness that he has with the Father, for us, then we don't have to be identical. I can vote differently from you. I can like different sporting teams or sporting codes to you. I can have different passions and convictions to yours. I can be good at some things and you can be good at others. But If we are open to being perfected in oneness, as Jesus is praying for us, then it is about both a recognition and a willingness for the parts of my character, the things that I do, and the way that I live in the world, for all the good things about who I am that reveal the great things about who God is, to be layered over the things about you that reveal who God is, which is then layered over the things about the multitude of believers in this church, in this city, in this country, and around the world who reveal in their own unique and individual ways who God is until we get this unfathomable magnificence revealed in the kaleidoscope of believers. Can you imagine the beauty of the church perfected in oneness in this way? Is that what we look like now? If we did... It would be staggering. It would be compelling. At the beginning of my message this morning, I mentioned that in one sense, in this particular section, Jesus prays for us. But in another sense, it's not about us at all. It's about those who will believe in Jesus through our word. Think about that for a moment. 
Jesus prays for the people that we will influence, that might come to faith through us. And he prays that we may all be one. Not just us, not just them, but all of us, all one. I mentioned earlier that we don't need to be identical. And I, for one, find great comfort in that. But in the same way that there is commonalities and similarities in God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, there should also be similarities and commonalities between believers. And it just so happens that the main point of commonality is woven into the beautiful poetry of this prayer. If you jump back a couple of verses, we get our first clue. Jesus prays for the 11 disciples that God would sanctify them in the truth. What is the truth? Your word is the truth. In John's gospel, what is the word? Go back to the very beginning of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The word is Jesus. Jesus prays in part three of this prayer for those who are yet to believe in him, in Jesus. There are a lot of things that we could build oneness around. We could build oneness around our behaviours, our doctrines, our preferences, our interpretations and so much more. But the one thing that Jesus prays for is that our oneness might be built around him and him only. That our oneness might be in Jesus and in Jesus only. All those other things we can build oneness around are not in and of themselves bad things but they can and they have throughout the history of the church and in the present of the church as well, quickly led to division as behaviours, doctrines, preferences and interpretations will all quickly differ over time across culture and context and basic human difference. But, when we are perfected in oneness and in the oneness of Jesus, Jesus and Jesus only, then that is powerful. That gets noticed. And that can get people believing. What has never mattered more? It's our sharing and showing of the experience and relationship that we, you and I, have with Jesus. I hate to break it to you, but you're actually pretty blessed and lucky that I'm with you this morning because I had a much, much, much better offer. You see, I had a call a couple of weeks ago inviting me down to Tasmania to spend four days with Will Graham, if you didn't know, it's okay. I had to ask the same, same question. Who's Will Graham? He's Billy Graham's grandson. It was going to be all expenses paid too, by the way. Will Graham's keen to come to the Gold Coast in the future and they wanted me to be one of three pastors to go from the Gold Coast to experience what he's doing in Tasmania at the moment. I actually made my first public declaration of faith at a Billy Graham crusade when I was eight years old. Yes, I am that old. 
So for, at least from nostalgic purposes, I was keen to go and see whether that sort of thing still worked. Had it changed and how it's changed? And could Anglicans, their unchurched friends and families, actually connect? Things didn't quite line up and I had to say thanks but no thanks. And instead I find myself here this morning preaching on this passage. And as I was reflecting, it struck me that it's actually not about stadiums full of people. That and that alone won't win people for Jesus in a way that's going to last. It's not flashy signs, big buildings, great programs, saying the right words in the right order, up-to-date music, brilliant preaching and cool people like you guys that will win over the believers who are yet to be. Those things individually sometimes will make a difference for a moment. But if we want to encourage belief that will last more than a moment, that will last for the rest of our lives into eternity, then the one thing and the only thing that I know that will have lasting impact is when my experience and relationship with Jesus is layered over your experience and relationship with Jesus, which is layered over their experience and relationship with Jesus, and so on, and so on, and so on. The good news is that when Jesus prays for the people who are to become believers through our words, it's not just our words alone. It is that beautiful kaleidoscope of the people of God working together by the power of the Holy Spirit, not revealing how good and cool and up-to-date and how right we are, but revealing the magnificence and the character of the person of God in Jesus. That oneness created is staggering. It's compelling. It's holy and it's what Jesus is praying right at the very end of his ministry. The last prayer that his disciples gathered together as a big group over here, almost like they're eavesdropping on this intimate moment between him and his father. That prayer made such a deep impact. that on that first day of Pentecost, thousands were converted. Thousands believed. And through that, throughout the ages, the church was formed and grew. St. Paul reminds us that it's Christ in us that is the hope of glory. That feels a bit weighty, doesn't it? But again, it's not us and us alone. It's all of us together revealing who God is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we might not be able to be one in the music that we prefer. We might not be able to be one in the worship style that we like, the the doctrine that we find the most profound, or the biblical interpretation that makes the most sense to us. But can we not be one in Jesus? It seems so simple. But I wonder if our attempts to be one in all those other things crowd out Jesus. Can we get over ourselves and each other? Just focus on Jesus. To allow ourselves to be perfected in oneness. In the oneness of Jesus. And as our oneness 
is integrated with the oneness of each other, that amazing kaleidoscope emerges of magnificence. It's staggering and compelling. Jesus prayed for this. Can we? Loving God, it's a big prayer to pray this morning. But can we be one as you are one? With the Father and the Spirit. Can we know that intimate connection with you as God? That in our journey of being perfected in oneness, can we realize that you aren't just revealed in our own individual ideologies and preferences? Uh, revealed most perfectly in Jesus. And the Jesus who is revealed through us because of our relationship with you. Holy Spirit work in this church and in us individually that we might individually know that we can't just individually do it. That it has to be all of us, all one, all together, all the time. We pray this big prayer in your mighty name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to sing.